right, I think we're recording, Chris. Okay. All right, we're live. Hey guys, it's Ted with the Ted Show, episode 223 today with my guest Chris Majoka from United Arts of Central Florida. So let us know you can hear us or see us. Uh, I definitely like the lighting better today. I don't have quite as many wrinkles as I normally do. <laughs> Uh, but give us a thumbs up, let us know we're connected. I don't know if you know the history there, Chris, but I did an entire show once and nobody could hear us, oh, yet I, nobody told <laughs> me. Amrit, up? what's up? Amrit's all the way from over, uh, I won't give your location, but it's far, far away. <laughs> and he's um, a super great guy that Kevin Barry actually introduced me to. Oh, so nice. welcome to the show. So Chris and I got introduced, we have to give kudos, uh, Boris Garbe. Boris. Boris. <laughs> Uh, and he's got the gallery, which is in Winter Park, Mills 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's, hey Wendy, uh, he's such a great guy and he's always trying to connect me with people who he thinks uh, would be positive on the show and you know the show's all about being positive. We wanna get the word out. We want people to know what's going on in our community. Uh, and definitely Chris is somebody we wanted to meet and so Boris, once you see this, Big kudos to you and thanks for the introduction. Appreciate it, Boris. All right, so welcome. So tell us a little bit about you. Give us a background. I mean, I want you to sure. start early. I don't want to be at first grade by 1225, <laughs> but I would really appreciate uh, the background because people want to know your why and kind of who you are. Well, it was a rainy May evening. <laughs> there it is. I'm glad I set that up. <laughs> so uh, I actually moved down here. Um, this month actually marks 10 years that I'm in Orlando and moved down from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, went to school down here at Full Sail University. Wonderful. Uh, where I received my bachelor's in recording arts and master's in entertainment business. And while I was uh, a student there, I ended up getting an internship within their in-house creative agency where um, once they started their sports partnerships and I was able to take students from their degree programs and work on projects that um, help promote Full Sail and the different uh, sports partnerships that they had at the time. So is that why, did you come to Orlando because of Full Sail? I did, yes. Okay. And I was planning on moving back afterwards, but... Uh, I don't hear any old. of that Boston accent. <laughs> I've lost, uh, lost quite a bit it. of it. All right, so I'd like to hear that at some point. It was a wicked long time ago. Oh, there it is. All right, so I got him to say the Boston stuff. Uh, so Full Sail is amazing. I think a lot of people hear about it, but they don't know about it. So you got a bachelor's and, bachelor's and master's Correct. from there. Um, tell us a little bit about the education experience over there. You went for a specific major. Did you end up finishing with that major, or once you got there, did you change with all the different programs they have? I did finish with that major. Uh, Full Sail is an amazing uh, university. It's an entertainment uh, and business, uh, entertainment business university, so they have a lot of technical degrees in film, graphic design, audio, uh, etc., as well as entertainment business, obviously, as I went through, and um, just their facilities are world class over there, and I was not expecting to go into the marketing world, but when I got that internship with their in-house creative agency and being able to produce those uh, video projects for the different sports partnerships they had, I kind of just got sucked into the marketing world and that has been my career here in uh, Central Florida ever since. And so how did you transition from that to the arts? Obviously most people, you probably love the arts your whole mm -hmm. life. Uh, how did you get into being part of the art scene and the arts community? So I, uh, after Full Sail, I actually went, for, um, went to a Fortune 500 company here in Central Florida, FIS Global. I uh, was there for about five or six months and uh, to be honest, the uh, Corporate cubicle world, nothing against FIS, great company, um, but I just, it was not my Wasn't cup of tea thing. as a creative yeah. Yeah. individual. Creatives usually don't like the cubicle. Yeah, or no, the, oddly it's enough. Too, it's too claustrophobic. <laughs> and most of my team were in uh, different states or different countries, so it was just uh, always over, over the phone, and um, I don't know, I just kind of missed that Wasn't your thing. connection to the community. So I uh, had a friend who formerly worked at uh, Full Sail University who was now leaving a position at United Arts of Central Florida, and she posted on Facebook that there was an opportunity over there, and uh, I was like, wow, this could be something where I really am you know, uh, doing something more fulfilling or positive sure. for the community, getting into the nonprofit field. I had never uh, looked into that before, but went in for an interview, and um, they liked what they saw. I liked the opportunity to uh, expose um, myself as well as the community to the arts, and. Uh, that's been my uh, career now for about three and a half years. So how was the transition from corporate to nonprofit? Because that's actually a big, it's a big thing. And you have mm -hmm. to, you have to, you, you, normally you have to realize that in the nonprofit world, 
you're most of the time going to take a salary cut. Yep. You're, you're certainly um, not going to have all the perks that you would have with a corporate position. So how was that transition for you? That transition was a, a little difficult and you kind of hit the nail on the head there as far as the uh, salary cut as well as uh, the benefits. But um, as far as being able to just wake up in the morning and feel that you are contributing to something larger than yourself and when you actually get to see the impact of the arts and how uh, people are affected um, by the arts or affected by the lack of the arts in their lives uh, really just kind of sucked me in and, um, and you know, I've kind of fell in love with the Central Florida community uh, right after that. I was here for seven years before I started at United Arts and never really felt a part of the community or like a, a resident. I was always still paying attention to uh, things that were going back up in Massachusetts, but once I got involved in the arts and started meeting people in this community, I was like, wow, this, this place is like nowhere else. Exactly. So talk about the arts community before we get into the nuts and bolts of what United Arts is about and mm -hmm. what the outreach that you do. The arts community here, we were talking about it before the show, the arts community is super strong and supportive overall. We actually have a giant arts community here. Mm -hmm. And so, but what we were talking about outside of our little bubble, our niche, people who are super involved in the community, a lot of people don't know about the arts programs. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by that when you got involved? I was. I mean, when I uh, initially, even just my first interview with United Arts, and I asked, you know, what kind of arts organizations do you support? And they rattled off over 60 organizations. And no I was here for seven years and maybe had heard of three or four of them. And uh, as a marketing uh, professional and going into a marketing degree or a marketing uh, job there, uh, that kind of was my uh, trigger there. Well, if I was here for seven years and didn't know much about the arts community, um, this is my opportunity to uh, change that story for somebody else who just moved here or has been here and was not aware of the community before. And I think you're the, let me say, hi John, hi Toby. Uh, and we'll respond to a lot, there's been, already been some questions. Uh, we'll respond to those because as they go by, you guys can't see what we see, but they go by so quickly, <laughs> I can't get to them. Um, John Wilde is, he said hi, and he's part of that damn radio show, and, uh, <laughs> the eco guys, I mean, he's super involved and always loves it when I bring anybody who's philanthropic on the show. So when you made the transition, what was your first, how do you get the word out? You now know that people don't know about the arts community, they don't mm -hmm. know about United Arts. What are some of the things that you did initially to try to get the word out, to try to change that about uh, the arts community? The first thing I did uh, at United Arts was actually uh, help overhaul the brand. Um, so I saw their business cards, it was uh, just red and white was uh, kind of the branding that they had and to me, um, had I just seen that as a, uh, you know, a layman just looking at it, I would not say this screams arts to me. Correct, right? <laughs> Isn't that funny how people, so a lot of people, your business card, I know that a lot of people say they're antiquated, but if I look at a card and it's from United Arts, and it doesn't look super artsy, like something I'm fascinated by, yeah, I would wonder about that. Yep, so we made it, the whole brand, a lot more colorful, um, a lot more artsy, and uh, the second thing was managing a nonprofit budget, having just come from a Fortune 500 uh, marketing <laughs> budget, and just realizing how much more um, a nonprofit's uh, need is to really communicate and connect with uh, local media outlets and uh, really help sell that um, that cause that you're supporting and being able to um, divulge some uh, in-kind uh, opportunities and uh, you know just out of the generosity of some of the media outlets here in this community has been amazing. Um, but I agree with you. That's really the uh, the biggest difference right so there. So how did you, when you <laughs> came in, so I do, I do some nonprofit consulting, so mm -hmm. when I go in and I'm taking a look at things, the first thing I look at is the board. Were you, did, did you come in, did you have to clean house, or did you just have such a great group, or was it just, you know, a lot of times what happens, there's stagnancy, there's a stagnant mm -hmm. um, thing that goes on with boards especially, and when I'm talking to people about their boards, their boards can make or break them, so if you have a very passive board that's not super involved or super connected, it can be the downfall of the organization, so what, what did you find when you came on board? Um, I think that was uh, partly the case when I came on board, uh, was the, the board and having some uh, uh, degree of stagnant. Um, however, I was fortunate enough that right after I was hired, there was a new development director that was hired as well. 
and she kind of came in and really overhauled that board of directors. Oh, good, I, you didn't have to be the bad guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Usually they bring me in, I'm like that George Clooney character that comes in and <laughs> fires everybody. Uh, because it's so important. People don't realize, mm -hmm. like, a lot of people take uh, the position on a board for a nonprofit. Uh, it's just something you go to once a month, you feel good about it. Right. But the nonprofits really do depend on the connections, not necessarily the checks that the board members can cut, but the connections to people who can support Absolutely. the organization. And actually, uh, to that point, we have uh, very successful board engagement meetings. We're, uh, we have about a 45 person board right now, so it's wow. uh, quite large. And we kind of um, subgroup them into uh, five or six uh, at a time and have these board engagement meetings where uh, we talk about you know things that they've seen in the community that they would like to see United Arts doing, and then uh, also work with them to see uh, with them and their positions and their standings and their companies of how they can help uh, actually execute those new ideas or new initiatives that uh, we want to bring forward. Forty-five, that's something. Yes. All right, so talk about United Arts. So mm -hmm. give us the basics about what United Arts does and some of the people that you touch, some of the uh, initiatives that you have put out that put out there and are currently working. Certainly. Uh, so basically the uh, nuts and bolts of United Arts is we are uh, obviously a 501c3 um, nonprofit organization and we are Central Florida's Arts Fund, the only uh, arts fund in the region and essentially we help support monetarily as well as with technical assistance and uh, just overall assistance and consulting uh, more than 60 arts and cultural organizations in a four county area. Oh, so you're the conduit. Correct. So does the, when you say you're the only fund, does that mean the federal, state, or local money, the money comes in to you, and then you help distribute it, help support the other arts programs that are... Absolutely, and that was the whole, uh, there's a, over 40 United Arts funds across the country. They are not tied to each other. They just uh, kind of manage similar things based on community needs. But basically, instead of having these 60-plus arts and cultural organizations all going down to Tallahassee, so uh, knocking fun. on doors, asking for you know uh, people to support their cause. We are sort of the centralized source that raised a large amount of dollars and then dis, uh, disseminate those to the um, different arts and cultural organizations through competitive grant programs. So what are some of the arts programs that we either have heard about or should hear about or both uh, that you help fund, you help contribute to the funding? Um, so, I mean, uh, more than 60 arts and cultural organizations, again, uh, we have small, mid-sized, and large budget organizations, so, uh, you know, from your small mom and pop uh, one-off events up to the uh, Orlando Museum of Art, Science Center, the Ballet, uh, Philharmonic Orchestra, things so like that. So you really do touch the entire arts yes. community. And so what are some of the things that you think uh, we need more of? Because obviously there's never enough funding for arts, it's been a challenge, you guys can hear that we've got something going on down there. <laughs> Uh, it's been a challenge to get funding for arts and extracurriculars, especially in our schools. Absolutely. Uh, so what are some of the things that you feel like we need more of in our community? Some of the programs that maybe uh, haven't been funded that need to be or don't have enough funding? I think uh, first off is uh, um, over the last three years since both myself and the new um, uh, ex uh, development director have come on board, uh, with the direction of Flora Maria Garcia, our CEO, she, uh, we have really made it a uh, point to become more diverse, inclusive, and accessible um, across the entire arts community in Central Florida. When we kind of first did an assessment, we noticed that most of the people going to these events and most of the programs that were being provided were geared towards the uh, older Caucasian upper class um, demographic, which is great but that was not necessarily representative of what Central Florida actually is as far as a community. So uh, a lot of the things that we've been doing is really helping to make sure that um, different ethnic and cultural uh, groups in Central Florida and communities are welcome and invited to the arts and, um, and that we are just uh, communicating with them and working with them to uh, really make sure that there's programming available and that people feel invited and know actually what is available to them in the arts community. And so what's a day look like for you? Are you always in fundraising mode 24-7? Or do you get, because you're the, you're the fund or you get funded mm -hmm. as the arts fund here, uh, is that not as task oriented? I think I know the answer to that already, <laughs> but I'm just gonna give them an opportunity to know. No, I mean, uh, my personal day, I, I basically am the uh, one person marketing department within United Arts of Central Florida, so my day uh, changes drastically. Uh, depending on um, which day you catch me on. But uh, I would say as, as far as an organization, we are always looking for uh, corporate partnerships, media partnerships, and putting together different programs uh, amongst different 
um, uh, corporations and universities and connecting them to the arts community so we can provide programming that affects all aspects. So there's a general entertainment value, but we also uh, uh, promote things um, for senior programming, kids programming, again, diversity and inclusion programming. Uh, we have a program at Evans High School right now um, called Career Pathways to Creative Sector Jobs, uh, where oh, we are cool. helping to um, kind of build up technical skill sets so these students can either go get a college degree, which we have partnerships with Valencia and UCF, um, for them to get scholarships, or they can go into the actual creative sector with all the um, different theme parks that we have here, where beforehand they were actually hiring people from outside of Central Florida to fulfill those roles, and we're trying to build that workforce right here in oh, our you're, community. You're, you're keeping it here. Absolutely. That's, that's really cool. Um, then I also want to ask, when you are working with, let's say, a kids program, uh, somebody might have an idea, it could be senior, it could be kids, listen to all of the things he's, and you definitely want to go, we'll share all your information later. But if you are somebody who wants to apply for the grant, are the grants only done once a year? Can people apply throughout the year? How does that process work? Um, the grants are, uh, there's multiple grant cycles and it depends uh, of what kind of grant you're looking for. But if you go onto unitedarts.cc, there is a, a grants tab where you can look at all the different grants that United Arts provides, um, or you can just contact us and say, hey, we have this idea and we'll be able to help facilitate whether it's us as the best partner for you or if we can help connect you with somebody that is going to be the better partner for um, whatever your idea is. And so list arts, because I think a lot of people go, all right, well, I'm music. Music is mm -hmm. arts, right? So you have, there's really no, if it falls into the arts category, it could be pretty much anything, but you go to the site, if it falls into arts, maybe there's a grant for you. So I want you to, I want to encourage you to look, to go uh, to the website, and again, we'll share it when we post um, the show later. All right, so let's talk about your project. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, because you are not just the director, the marketing guru, the one-man show, <laughs> you also are a talented artist in your own right. So give them a little background on that. Certainly. So uh, again, my background with Full Sail was uh, an audio-related degree, but um, uh, last year I was writing LinkedIn articles uh, based on the work that we were doing at United Arts of how nonprofits can become more diverse and inclusive, and how that actually affects their uh, not only you know the holistic uh, feel-good um, mentality, but also actually affects their ROI and bottom line. As I was writing those articles, uh, we had the hurricanes that came through in 2017 that really devastated Puerto Rico. And uh, as many of you know, we have over 200,000 Puerto Ricans who have already migrated to um, or evacuated to Central Florida from the island of Puerto Rico. And I had written an article about how, um, you know, we, this actually can be an opportunity for businesses to get involved with uh, this whole new uh, market that has just come over here. And I started getting a lot of comments uh, that were somewhat misguided as far as, you know, why are we letting these immigrants into our country? And uh, you know why are we supporting um, these people who are on our own? And uh, uh, news flash: Puerto Ricans are actual. Uh, I've, I did US a show citizens. like that. I, we did a show right after. I know that the pain. People, it, it was crazy. I had people come on. I had to actually remove them. It's the, probably the only time I've ever had to tell somebody you got to move to another sandbox and have yep. a discussion there. Uh, was somebody was talking about that, and all they did was say that we have displaced Puerto Ricans here. And I got a lot of, well, they're not even citizens, they're from another country. And I thought, right. oh my God, please don't tell me you were educated <laughs> in Florida, because that's a horrible thing to think, that you don't even know Puerto Rico is part of the United States. Uh, so there's definitely challenges there. So Absolutely. you saw the challenges, and then that obviously motivated you. Right. And so with, uh, luckily, with all of the connections I had already made within the, um, uh, with uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, U.S., uh, or Central Florida-based Puerto Ricans and a lot of the people that were coming over, I was just hearing a lot of the stories and what people were going through and the challenges they were facing once they got here. And uh, Central Florida did an amazing job, both um, the city of Orlando and Orange County, um, of uh, helping to onboard Puerto Ricans and give them resources, but there was still just a lot of struggle. And what I also found was that um, you know Central Florida residents didn't know a whole lot about what was actually going on or how this would impact our community. So I had the idea to create a documentary film, uh, which starts production in just a couple weeks, and that is really going to help explore what it means now for Central Florida to have hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans here, and how this is going to affect our community moving forward, both from the perspective of 
uh, uh, Puerto Rican uh, evacuees as well as long-term Central Florida residents and how we can all uh, kumbaya and get along. Kumbaya. <laughs> I think what's interesting about that is that people really, they hear it on the news mm -hmm. and they're told that we have this influx um, and then they repeat it, whatever they heard on the news, but they actually either haven't been impacted by it yet right. or they don't know that they've been impacted yep. by it yet. So are you going to explore, uh, I'm sure you're going to have some very interesting characters that you interview, <laughs> because people really are very, they're clueless about uh, what's really transpired. I mean, it was only recently that um, Puerto Rico admitted that there were 1,400 people that passed over there instead of the 65 right. or whatever the number was. So if you can imagine the numbers that the news is reporting, I believe that there's been a huge influx. And that was a, that was a challenge I think for the city, especially for the county government, and then for housing. Yep. And so what, is, what are you going to focus on? Are you going to interview uh, displaced uh, Puerto Ricans? Are you going to interview people who go, where are the Puerto Ricans? Are you going to interview people who go, I don't want the Puerto Ricans here? Because <laughs> uh, I know it's a mishmash in our city. Right. So there's actual, uh, actually kind of two phases of this project. The first phase, which goes into production again in September here, is going to be a short film, a 20 to 30 minute film that is focusing on one family. It's uh, the, the Diaz family, um, Alex and his wife and his two daughters. And um, they have come over and uh, are just the most resilient people uh, you'll ever meet. And they have the most positive attitude despite everything that they've been through. And I think that's really uh, kind of an eye opener for a lot of people who think that, um, oh, now we have all these people coming from an island that was in you know a financial crisis and they're coming over here and eating up our resources when the uh, actual um, uh, reality is that people are, these uh, Puerto Ricans are actually coming here, contributing to our community, creating jobs actually, uh, creating new businesses and are going to help stimulate our economy. Um, and that is kind of the basis of the short film which will uh, be uh, sent around to the film festival circuits here. Was it, was it super emotional when you were doing it? Because I would imagine they've got like a, a, a story. Yes. And I, I know that another of the comments that I had when we were talking about that on the show, I had people private message me saying, um, I, they need to be deported. Uh, they're United States. <laughs> they're part of the United right. States. Where are you deporting them? Puerto Rico is a uh, So <laughs> I, know the I know some of the struggles, at least on the periphery of uh, what they're going through. So was it was it an emotional, or has it been an emotional time when you're interviewed, interviewing them or, or preparing to do the documentary with them? Certainly, I mean, I have uh, actually uh, choked up a number of times, even just in my pre-interviews, I've heard uh, stories even as sad as, um, especially in the mountainous regions, the central mountainous regions of the island, where kind of all access to roads and food and healthcare were uh, blocked off, that there were some villages that actually had to uh, round up their um, pets from different families and um, and eat their pets for food. Uh, you know, they're fam basically families, you know, as many of you have your uh, fur babies and right. uh, to imagine actually having to be in a situation where that is your last resort as a food source. Um, and to me that's, you know, just something that I feel like people need to hear about um, and, and actually be a reason for why there is help needed uh, for Puerto Ricans on the island, but also all the Puerto Ricans who have come over here to Central Florida. So you obviously had a million different ways that you could go, especially if you wanted to make a documentary. Mm -hmm. Why this specific topic? Did somebody move you at a point and then it made you realize, wow, I need to explore this more? Or how did you get to focusing on the transplants, the migration, the whatever word that everybody's gonna use, uh, the Puerto Ricans that were displaced here? I mean, I think it really was just the uh, the different comments I was hearing. I was hearing very positive things as well, but just the negative comments told me that there was a uh, a point where there was some education that could be provided here to Central Floridians, and uh, that is actually um, probably even the more exciting part than the short film is there will be a full length uh, film, a one hour film uh, that I'm in partnership or working on a partnership right now with the local WCF PBS station where when we screen those, uh, that film, uh, getting close to the second anniversary of uh, the, the hurricane, so that'll be next September, uh, we're gonna be screening those through different Central Florida communities, uh, watch the one hour film, and actually have uh, double that screening as kind of town hall type discussions where Central Florida residents, both long-term and uh, new Puerto Rican uh, evacuees, can actually sit there and uh, hash it out and talk about wow. the different topics covered in the film. And to me, that's the most important part is really just to 
help people have a new perspective and get to see what um, what somebody else is going through. And what are some of the challenges? Uh, we have we, I've had a lot of document documentary filmmakers that have come on the show, mm -hmm. and so what what have you seen the biggest challenges? You've obviously got a great topic. But um, if you're a starving artist, like that usually goes <laughs> hand in hand with the word artist, what are some of the things that um, you face that maybe the community could embrace you with and help you out with? Certainly, I think it's actually uh, just uh, the connections and uh, with the documentary film, there's so many different avenues that you can go, as you've mentioned, and so many different ways to tell the story. So I think the biggest challenge is finding the right connections uh, to help tell the best story. Um, and those connections could be, you know, uh, financial. Obviously, um, if anybody wants to help fund this film, please, uh, <laughs> please say, reach out. Say the pitch, buddy. <laughs> say the pitch. But um, uh, you know, it, and the good thing is actually this is going to have some uh, national appeal as well, sure. and uh, possibly even getting into education. So it's I think just finding um, all the right pieces. There's so many pieces that you could put together in different ways and different equations, but it's finding the right fundraisers, the right supporters the right people to help uh, carry this message out and then the right distribution channels as far as where is this actually going to live and how is this going to make the most impact and affect the most people. I love it. All right, so we're going to share all of Chris's contact information, how you can reach him, how you can uh, support the film, how you can support the documentary film, right? Same yep. thing. <laughs> how you can support United Arts of Central Florida. Uh, when we share the show later on, we'll post everything. Reach out to him. I think it's so critical that we, as a community, continue to support the arts and that we embrace those people who are going outside kind of this little cocoon and trying to reach more people and educate more people. Uh, so any parting words of wisdom for them, anything you want to share with them about your journey, about anything upcoming um, that you want to leave them with? Um, I think the biggest thing is, uh, A, uh, I'm going to stick here real quick with the arts community. Um, if you guys don't know, the uh, uh, state of Florida has made a drastic funding cut uh, to the arts community. And by drastic, I mean that in 2015, we were the uh, 10th um, most funded state uh, for arts and culture in the country. Um, as of this last year's decision, which was going to start taking effect in 2019 here, uh, Central Florida's arts community and the state of Florida is actually ranked number 48th in the nation as far as arts and cultural support. So that was a funding cut of, um, I believe it was over 90%. And what used to be a about a $45 million budget is now down to about uh, $2 million to fund all of the arts and cultural organizations within the entire state of Florida. Wow. So uh, help from corporations task. and uh, individual donors is really more critical than ever because there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are doing amazing work out in the community and impacting so many people that uh, will go under if they do not have the support from people like you. All right, so you've been a joy to have on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Again, we're going to share all of Chris's contact information. We love you guys. Get out and support the arts. You know how important that is. You can find his information when we share the show. You can go to thetedshow.com. Um, we want you to get involved. If, there's, if you have an arts project, uh, you're part of an organization, and you're looking for grant money, um, first of all, we have to fight that whole $2 right. million dollars across the world. Uh, but there's definitely an opportunity for you to get involved in the collaboration that goes on in our arts community is so important. I think that's a blessing that we have in the city and our Central Florida area. So reach out to Chris. Again, we'll share all the information. Uh, we love you guys, and we'll see you. I have two shows this afternoon. We'll see you in a little bit. Love you. Thank you, Ted. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.